In 1980, we were witnesses to a massive geological event at Mount St. Helens that helped us learn some important insights about catastrophic processes and the way certain geologic features form. Well, as we relate these observations to the geology of the world, it's important for us to remember that what we're being taught today by natural science in our public schools are not facts about fossils, but an interpretation. An interpretation that stems from the scientist's worldview of rigid philosophical naturalism. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to assert to you today that the global flood that's described in Genesis was a real and historical event. An event that has been misinterpreted by natural science. The geology of that event has been misinterpreted. And ladies and gentlemen, I would like to ask you, if there has been an event like the one described here in Genesis 6, Think, consider for yourself, what would you expect to find? It says, And the waters prevailed so mightily upon the earth that all the high mounts under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed above the mountains, covering them fifteen cubits deep, and all flesh died that moved upon the earth. Birds, cattle, beasts, all swarming creatures that swarm upon the earth, and every man, everything on dry land in whose nostrils of the breath of life died. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if there had been an event like this one described in Genesis, what else, again, would we expect to find other than what we indeed find? We live on a flood wasteland. The evidence for this event is monumental, and it is everywhere we look. The world is covered in sedimentary rock layers that are hundreds of feet thick, laden with the fossils of dead plants and animals. Well, the eruption of Mount St. Helens helped us see that geologic features claimed to require millions of years can instead form in minutes to hours during catastrophic events. Well, the eruption of Mount St. Helens began with a massive earthquake. A 5.1 earthquake shook loose a bulge shown here that it formed on the north flank of Mount St. Helens, resulting in the largest landslide ever recorded in human history. This landslide uncorked the volcano, triggering an explosion of the force of 500 atomic bombs. The steam-filled lateral blast shot out at about 200 miles per hour with the temperature inside the cloud exceeding 350 degrees Celsius. A mushroom cloud formed that was 40 miles wide. The, the stem of this mushroom cloud shown here is alone 10 miles wide. The massive column of ash shot 15 miles into the air. Shown photographed here from a satellite 22,000 miles high. By early the next day, the ash cloud had spread to central United States with accumulations reported as far away as eastern Oklahoma. Two days later, fine ash was detected by air pollution monitors in several cities of the northeastern United States. Some of the ash drifted around the globe within about two weeks. The eruption reduced the elevation of the mountain summit by 1,300 feet and it left behind a mile-wide crater. Well, it only took somewhere between five to nine minutes to completely destroy the surrounding landscape, leaving behind a smoldering pumice plain and toppled forests. The once pristine forest and the most every living thing was killed over an area of about 230 square miles. The blast was so strong it toppled forestry equipment like it was toys. 200 homes were destroyed by the eruption, most of them by mud flows, we call lahars. Shown here on this image is, is the height at which the mud flows reached at Mount St. Helens. Notice the person standing there for scale. 57 people died in the eruption. There was a relatively low toll, death toll because most of the people were evacuated. The people that died in the uh, eruption were those who were monitoring the volcano, your scientists and photographers who were thought to have been at uh, it within a safe area. The eruption of Mount St. Helens helped us see that certain geologic features, such as strata, the layers of rocks, can form rapidly during catastrophic events. It does not take millions of years or changes in depositional environment. Stratified deposits up to 400 feet thick formed by the eruptions at Mount St. Helens. On this canyon wall, you will see three separate geological units. The bottom layer is from airfall tephra material, which occurred on the afternoon of the initial eruption on May 18th. The middle layer was created by a pyroclastic flow. And two years later, a mud flow deposited another layer on the top. 
Well, this pyroclastic flow in the middle is particularly interesting. Look at this video of what a pyroclastic flow is. It is basically a landslide coming down out of a volcano, a landslide of material, hot gaseous material. There were at least 17 separate pyroclastic flows that descended Mount St. Helens during the May 18th eruption. These typically travel at, at over 100 kilometers per hour and reach temperatures of well over 400 degrees Celsius. Well, that middle layer on that previous slide is again shown here. Note the layers. It is amazing because we're taught that individual layers like this take a long time to form. But here, a deposit more than, more than 25 feet in thickness and containing upwards of 100 thin layers accumulating just one day from pyroclastic flows. Some layers formed that were a meter high. Others that were very fine lamina of only millimeters in thickness. Both were deposited in just a few seconds each. <clears throat> well, experimentally, we know it doesn't take long time periods for layers to form. You can take a, uh, a, a shovel full of material and put it in a, a, a column like this and shake it up. And the particles will settle out into layers automatically. The differences in the, 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 the masses of the particles or their density or their shape will cause them to settle out at different rates, forming layers. It doesn't take long time periods or changes in depositional environment. Or look at this video here um, made with two different par particles of two different colors with two different masses showing that these two different particles will separate into layers while just flowing downhill. It doesn't take long time periods for layers to form like this. And we saw that well out at Mount St. Helens. Well, the eruption at Mount St. Helens also helped us see that canyons can form rapidly. Erosion features like canyons are typically interpreted as having formed through slow and gradual actions of rivers and streams, often believed to require millions of years. However, rapid erosion of canyons were observed in just one day out at Mount St. Helens. On May 19, 1982, an eruption melted the snow that had accumulated in the crater over the winter, causing a devastating mud flow, shown here. Now, mud flows are particularly destructive events, particularly powerful uh, forces for erosion. It's not the water that has the real power of erosion, but it's what the water carries with it. Water that's coming down at elevations will have a lot of momentum and a lot of inertia behind it, enabling it to carry material, not just small particles or even gravel, but boulders and trees are carried along by waters that are flowing in catastrophic events like this. Well, this mud flow eroded a canyon system up to 140 feet deep. The deepest part of the canyon has affectionately been called the Little Grand Canyon of the Tudor River because it is 140th the size of its namesake. Shown here again, the Little Grand Canyon, or just another look at it here. Well, when examining the origin of canyons, then we must ask the question, was it a, a lot of time and a little bit of water? Or was it a lot of water and a little bit of time? Well, canyon systems seem to be much more consistent with catastrophic drainage than slow and gradual erosion. Well, we also learned important insights from Mount St. Helens about plant fossils. And one insight has to do with how coal formed. Coal seams have been found that are more than 200 feet thick, and it has been claimed that the plant material that became coal accumulated through the slow and gradual growth of plants in swamps. However, we now know that most coal is composed primarily of bark. Well, during the eruption of Mount St. Helens, entire forests were decimated, and many of those trees were, were floating in Spirit Lake. Well, while floating there on Spirit Lake, these trees had rubbed off all their bark. So working on a theory that peat might be accumulating on the bottom of Spirit Lake, some researchers from the Institute for Creation Research, um, including Steve Austin, dove down to the bottom of Spirit Lake to take a look. And on the bottom of Spirit Lake, sure enough, they found massive layers of peat accumulating there that was predominantly bark, similar to the, the, the coal found in much of the world. Well, upright trees have also been used by uniformitarian geologists as an example of deep time. For example, at Yellowstone, there are some upright trees found there on what is called Specimen Ridge. 
The reader board there at Specimen Ridge reads this. Across the valley rise the slope of Specimen Ridge, but the forest we see there today is only the latest chapter in a remarkable story. Buried within the volcanic rocks that compose the mountain are 27 distinct layers of fossil forest that flourished 50 million years ago. Well, out at Mount St. Helens, trees were, the trees that were sheared off, some of these were observed floating upright in Spirit Lake. Well, this suggested a mechanism for the formation of upright trees that was provo proposed by Steve Austin of the Institute for Creation Research. It is theorized that these upright trees float like the ones floating at Spirit Lake would sink down to the bottom and become rapidly buried by sediments. Well, in a prolonged catastrophic, catastrophic event, like out at Mount St. Helens, after being embedded in the bottom, they would be subsequently buried by other layers of strata, the kinds of layered rocks that tend to form in catastrophic events. This helped explain the enigmatic polystrate fossils that are found. Polystrate trees, trees that pass through multiple layers of, of fossiliferous rock have been found and many times are associated with coal. Well, it's simply not possible for fossils to be buried gradually over many thousands or hundreds of thousands of years due to the speed of decomposition. During slow, uniformitarian type burial, the top part of, the, of any tree would rot away long before it could be protected by sediments. Polystrate fossils like the one you see here point to the certainty of rapid burial and were likely formed by this kind of action during the great biblical flood of Noah. Ladies and gentlemen, there was a global flood, and the fossil record is a monumental body of evidence to this event. And interpreting it differently has been devastating because of what the fossil record was always supposed to be, and that's a memorial, an important reminder to us of that terrible day of judgment, a day of judgment brought by God because of the sin on the earth. These layers of rocks and these fossils were supposed to be a reminder to us to the end of time of just how much God hates sin and a reminder that his judgment is coming again, a, a judgment that, uh, that Jesus reminded us would, would come again suddenly. As it was in the days of Noah, he reminded, so will be in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married, they were given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Ladies and gentlemen, just as God provided Noah a way to be saved from the coming judgment, so he has provided a way for us to be saved from the judgment that is to come as well. All he asks is that we repent of our sins, turn away from these things that are separating us from God. Jesus has already paid the penalty for us.